All right, bias questions. Some questions in a survey uh, or in a study may use language that people can associate with emotions. So for example, if the question was phrased, how much of your time do you waste on Facebook? That word waste has a very negative connotation. You may not think that the time you spend on Facebook or Instagram or Snapchat is wasted time. That's your social interaction with people, so you may not think that it's wasted time. So using that word waste instead of maybe what better word could we use to make this not biased? Spend. Just how much time you spend on Facebook or social media or whatever it may be. Okay, this, uh, this next one, obviously, it was written by a math teacher. Do you prefer the wonderful math class or your boring Shakespeare class? Okay, you're putting emotions and thoughts into the person's head when you ask the question. That's bias, okay? Um, or something like this. A uh, question may refer to a majority or a supposed authority. So would you agree with the NCAE, that's a, a teaching association, that teachers should be paid more for earning their master's degree? So when you throw that information about agreeing with the NCAE, you're making people think, well, there's there's like an authority figure that that believes that teachers should earn their master's degree, so maybe I should believe that too, instead of just saying, do you agree that teachers, or not even agree, how about just do you believe that teachers should be paid more for earning their master's degree? Um, asking people whether they agree with a certain authority, you're putting bias in your question. Um, or it could just be too wordy. Do you disagree with people who oppose the ban on smoking in public places? So this is kind of like a double negative here. Disagree and oppose. You've got two negative words. So you're trying to sit there and figure out, well, what exactly is that question asking me? I mean, I don't think people should smoke in public places, but does that mean I should answer yes to this? Or does it mean that I should answer no to this? So it's very, very important that your survey questions be phrased clearly um, so that there isn't that confusion because that's going to affect your results. Okay. We also have sampling bias. And that's when one or more subgroups of a population are either overrepresented or underrepresented. So you have to have random and fair selection when you are trying to sample. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. Voluntary, that's usually not very good. Okay, if you ask people to voluntarily turn in a survey, you're not necessarily going to get very uh, well distributed results. Convenience, when the questioner stays in one place. So you're not interacting with everybody, kind of like the walking to the coffee shop. Well, not everybody drinks coffee, so you're missing that that group is overrepresented, whereas other groups are underrepresented. Exclusion. Sometimes this happens. They will purposefully only ask certain people because maybe they know what their answer is going to be, or they, you know, they just don't associate with other people. <clears throat> Underrepresentation. Just not not asking enough people. Uh, now this. Uh, this says that you should have at least one-sixth of a population to uh, have a fair representation or at least 30 people. So that's kind of something to keep in the back, back of your mind. Not being random. Calling the first five people on every page of the home book. What about all the other 200 people on that page? Uh, they, they, have, they don't have a shot. Self-selection. People choose their own groups. These are all examples of sampling bias. A lack of double blindness. We talked about blindness the other day, last week. Um, the sampler knows which group or product the person is selecting, so it, it's really just best to have double bias. Okay. So, is this biased or unbiased? A person asks, do you prefer delicious pancakes or cold soggy cereal? Obviously, that is bias. You're giving people um, the idea that uh, pancakes
pancakes are better than cereal just by the adjectives that you throw in there. So leave out the adjectives, leave out the delicious and the cold and soggy, and then that would be an unbiased question. Okay, how about this one? Asking people shopping at a farmer's market if they think locally grown fruits and vegetables are healthier than supermarket fruits and vegetables. Why is this biased? Okay, they're asking people at the farmer's market. Clearly they are there for a reason. Farmer's markets aren't necessarily very convenient. We have one at Babson that's open once a week for like three hours on Thursday afternoons and evenings. You have a very limited selection and you have a very limited amount of time to go. But people do it because they think those products are better. So obviously if you ask those people whether they think that's better, their answer could be yes. That's sampling bias right there. It's not in the question. The problem's not with the question, but the problem is with who you're asking. Okay, how about this? A survey about whether or not teachers who earn their master's degree should be paid more is sent out to all teachers in North Carolina. Obviously it's biased. Why is it biased? They're asking the teachers. Obviously we're going to say that we should be paid more. I mean, duh. Who doesn't think they should be paid more? Okay, now here is another um, thing that we need to be aware of when we're summarizing our data. When we're summarizing our data. One thing that you have to think about is there's no causation. Uh, the cause could be affected by something other than what is being studied. Okay? Uh, just because you see a correlation, just because when one thing increases, something else increases, doesn't necessarily mean that it caused that increase. So you have to be careful when you summarize this data. So for example, here's the example here. Frogs with no legs are deaf. Well, just because they don't have legs doesn't cause them to be deaf. But there's probably more things going on there. There was some kind of birth defect. So if you if a frog's born without legs, then well, it kind of makes sense that there would be something else wrong with the frog. Um, huh? Okay, but when they grow up, they're supposed to have them. When they're a tadpole, they don't have legs. But when they're a frog, they're supposed to have legs. Okay. Um, this one. Bless you. This one really gets people. And this is something you need to be aware of when you're reading about studies and results and things. Apply the results, bless you, to the population incorrectly. So, for example, just because 85% of the people in this class like math, we're going to go with that number. We're going to say 85% of people like math. It doesn't mean that 85% of all the students in the school like math. Just because I asked y'all and 85% of you say that you like math, it does not mean that if I went out and asked everybody in the school, that 85% of the school would say that. So you cannot apply results from a smaller population to a larger population, uh, unless that's where your survey, uh, your sample came from. If I took kids from every class and asked them this question and 85% of them said yes, then yeah, I could apply that to the whole school. But my sample didn't come from the whole school, so I couldn't apply the results to the whole school. Um, so you have to be careful with that. Okay. And that's kind of confusing. Okay, so we're going to pause for a second. Before margin of error, this is something that you're probably actually familiar with. The, the most common um, example that you would probably be familiar with is if you were watching the news before the presidential election. You know, they always say, well, in the polls, this candidate has 51% of the vote with a margin of error of plus or minus 3%. Well, what that means is they're just taking a sampling of people. When, when they do these polls, they're not call, they're not calling up every registered voter and saying, "Hey, who are you gonna who are you gonna vote for?" Okay, they're they're taking a sample. Whether they do a stratified sample, they split the United States up into regions and ask this many people from each region, or they may just be focusing on certain regions. But 
they calculate the margin of error. And so if they say this candidate has 51% of the vote with margin of error plus or minus three, that means that really they've got somewhere between 48% and 54% of the vote. Um, they calculate it <clears throat> based on the number of people um, and that proportion. So it also means that we're only 95% certain. We're not 100% certain, but we're 95% certain that the results are between that range. So we take the percent and we subtract the margin of error and the percent and we add the margin of error and that gives us our range. And we're 95% confident that the actual results are in that range. So here's what I was just talking about. Example number one, candidate uh, testers has a 76% approval rating with a 6% margin of error. That means that we are 95% certain that Kesters has an approval rating between 70% and 82%. We're not very confident. That's, that's a big range. That probably means that we didn't have a very big sample size. Let's look at number two. Senator Smith and Miller in a close election. Senator Smith is projected to get 52% of the vote with a 5% margin of error. So the highest amount of the vote that Smith is projected to get, we add it, that's 57%. The smallest amount, we subtract it, that's 47%. Let's look at C. What is the highest amount of the vote that Miller is projected to get? Well, Miller will get the highest percentage if Smith gets the lower percentage. So if we take 47% away from 100, then Miller would get 53% of the vote max. So that's kind of how that's figured out. Here's a different way that this question could be asked. The percentage of people who speak through a town is between 35% and 43%. Find the mean or average percent of people who speak and the margin of error. So our range is from 35 to 43. So our mean is somewhere in between that range. So there's a range of eight. It's evenly divided, so we divide that by two, so our, error, our margin of error is four, and our mean would be 39. 39 is directly in between 35 and 43. So the mean is 39, the margin of error there is four. Now let's look at how we actually calculate the margin of error, because they might ask you to do this. Uh, and this formula is at the top of the next page. Okay, in that box. Calculating the margin of error. It is 2 times the square root of P times 1 minus P divided by N. Okay, P times 1 minus P divided by N. P is the percentage of people that agree to something, whether they're voting for this candidate or in the last example, the number of people that speed, uh, but we express it as a decimal. So if it's what was the last one? 35%, then we put it in as 0.35. And N is the number of people that we're dealing with. Uh, here's the certainty statement. This is what you can say every single time. We are 95%, oh, I forgot the word confident. You should be confident right there. 95% confident that between the percentage minus the margin of error and the percentage plus the margin of error, people prefer whatever we're talking about. Okay, that's kind of your frame if it asks you for a certainty statement. So here's another example. 57% of people prefer colon A with a margin of error of 7.1%. So that means we are 95% certain that 49.1% and that between 49.1% and 64.1% people prefer colon A. So it's kind of a big range because that margin of error is kind of big. Let's look at example four. In a poll of 150 students, 78% said that they enjoyed their teachers this year. Let's work out the margin of error. So we've got to express this percent as a decimal, 0.78. So in our calculator, we're going to put two times the square root of 0.78 times one minus 0.78 divided by 150. Now we got to be careful with our uh, parentheses. 